Welcome back to another episode of Tuxedo Time Podcast, Podcast edition. edition. Nailed it. Guess where we are. You know exactly where we are. I was going to say, I know exactly where we are. I'm looking right at you in where we are. If you're chip, listening. Chip, 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 chip. Caca! Caca! <laughs> We're sitting outside. <laughs> so if bird noises bother you, it might be an idea to turn this one off, skip it, but... I just realized that that bird, I think it's an owl, sounds like... And that that song reminds me of a story that we should tell on the podcast. No, because that actually is. (laughs) Talk Talk dirty to me. me. (laughs) Isn't that the song you were whistling? whistling? (laughs) Oh, got it. Those are two different songs. Got it. Sounds sounds similar. Some people really don't like whistling. Yeah. So I wonder if that triggered anybody. Probably. I don't love whistling. But I know you love whistling, so I like whistling because I love you. I'm a whistler, okay? I know you are. Yeah. If you can hear this sound, can you hear that? I can hear it. That's ice in a, what is this called? A thermal cup? I've liked whistling since I was a kid because my grandfather, who was a carpenter, always used to sing me, whistle while you work. (laughs) Do you remember that song? (laughs) Yes, I do. Anyway. Both of us, actually, Chris and I both have like thermal cups with water and ice in them because it's hotter than all Jesus outside. (laughs) What temperature is it today, Chris? Let's see. A temperature that we never get in St. John's, Newfoundland, I'm sure. Yeah, but see what's going to happen is you're going to report this in Celsius, but most of our viewers are going to be alienated by that because they use Fahrenheit. Hey, convert 30 degrees Celsius to Fahrenheit. 30 degrees Celsius is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. It's hotter than all Jesus. True. God, I don't know how to do 30 degrees. Like 2017 Celsius is my ideal temp. Like right now, I'm basically in the nude on our patio right now. Like (laughs) gut is hanging out. I got a bra on. Okay, so the purpose of today's episode isn't to tell you about the bird that's screeching in the background. But we're going to talk about... That's the one. I'm not hearing that one. Is that an owl? I don't know. It sounds kind of like who's. (laughs) Okay, today's episode, we're going to be kind of... We're not really talking about photo- Well, we're kind of talking. We're talking about... This is basically words. This is our origin story. No, it's not. Yeah, it is. Because Vancouver is our origin story. And this is a behind the scenes on the Vancouver episode we did. We're going to talk about more about the film itself, the thought process. So if anyone is confused about what Becky's talking about, you're probably not confused because anybody who's listening to this podcast probably follows and watches our YouTube channel. YouTube? YouTube? Channel? YouTube channel? You maybe follow our YouTube channel. But... If you don't know what we're talking about, we released a film recently called The City That Changed Our Lives. And no, that's it was called The City That Changed Our Life. Okay, fine. I don't even know <laughs> the title of it. But anyway, it's a story about the whole Vancouver story, basically. Yeah. And what the city meant to us, everything we faced when we were there, including hardships, and how our life trajectory was rapidly altered. Yeah. And we took a bit more of an abstract approach to it that was a little bit more, instead of saying, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened... Because we've already done that on the vlog. Right. Um, it was more so a thematic overview, shall we say, that was maybe a little bit more relatable to some people. A bit more generic and abstract that was probably more relatable to people who are watching it. Because I think everybody in their life at some point goes through hardship and life change that was thrust upon them without their consent. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I guess that right there is kind of the essence of what the film was, is that uh, amazing opportunities can come from the hardest, what seems like the hardest times of your life. And social media can, viewing right. the, your, someone's life through the lens of social media can really distort reality. Sh- distort reality, exactly. Yeah, because that's essentially what happened to us. Now, if you guys want to know like more about that story, I'll link all of the videos that you need to watch in order to get caught up in that story in the show notes, which is beckyandchris.com slash podcast, whatever episode number this is, 11, I think. But um, yeah, so this was kind of more of like a filmic, abstract story told of that year in Vancouver, kind of a tribute to Vancouver, um, and not just us sitting down and talking, but more of like a, a short film. It's kind of one of our, I think that's like a, the first short film we've made on our channel. I don't know. What is a short film, though? Well, I guess to me, like a short film... I'm sure like, quote unquote, real filmmakers would be like, oh, you've never made a film in your life, Becky and Chris. Yeah. I guess to me, like a short film would be something that's like planned, storyboarded, scripted, tells a story from start to finish... And we, this is the first time we've kind of done that in fully. Like we've done scripts, for, some scripts, loose scripts for so other videos. So would a documentary then that you do on the fly, like say Cold Island, not be a film? Well, I think that would be called like more of a documentary. Like that's like a docu series. Like you have short film, and then you have documentary. documentary. Fall under the umbrella of film? Yeah, I guess so. 
I think anyway. it's I think it's just like a genre of film. Yeah, I think that whatever label you put on it doesn't really matter as much as the product itself. Yeah, I agree. I learned so much, man, making this video. Like, I think that's like the coolest thing about YouTube and working for yourself is being able to um, experiment with different types of content delivery. And we're so used to doing vlogs all the time and run and gun and documenting. Cold Island was... A do- I would consider a docu series, but it was still documenting and running gun. But we kind of had more of a structure and, and conceptual idea of what that was going to be. But this video was like we scripted it, we storyboarded it, we did these like abstract um, narratives, we did these like in depth edits, and and I feel like telling the story through animation and different types of abstract sequences. We've never really done that before. I think we use different editing styles and different media like you said Mm -hmm. we did motion graphics we're more heavy on the motion graphics than we normally are yeah (laughs) in addition to titles and also as you said a little bit less uh, a little bit more abstract in the concepts yeah for sure so let's talk about the the concept a little bit in the abstract way that we kind of told that story so we didn't want to sit there and say first this happened then this happened so we kind of had to wrap our heads around how we wanted to tell a story and what like, was it third person? Was it first person? So we started the film off basically with a tease of what the film was about, because, of course, every good story has a beginning, middle and end. And when I heard that the first time, I think Casey and I said it was the first time I ever heard that. Is that a good story? Is a beginning, middle and end or whatever? What does that even fucking mean? <laughs> beginning, middle and end. OK, but like elaborate on that shit. So what Act does it mean? One. So for me. Uh, and I, I've taken some courses over the last couple of months through the pandemic on filmmaking and documentary filmmaking. And the beginning is like the tease. So like you start off your film or your video with like a tease of what's happening to kind of hook the viewer into what they're going to get through throughout the film. Then, of course, the middle is the plot, how everything unfolds, the stories that are told, whether that's one story, two stories, three stories. And then the ending is a conclusion. So how all of those things tie up. So that was helpful. I think like learning more. I'm, not, I'm sometimes a little bit simple, like. I feel like it's obvious what a beginning, middle, and end means. But, like, when you're trying to wrap your head around telling a story, making a short film or documentary, like, when you really start to think about it, it's like, wait, what? Like, it's almost overwhelming with when you're trying to tell a story of, of magnitude or of size that there's a lot of information. Like, where do you start? What do you put it in? What's the flow? And what's what does the audience want to see? And what's the takeaway? Well, it's kind of like a little puzzle. Yeah. And You've I got think all like, these pieces, and you're trying to construct it into a digestible interesting form right and oftentimes doing it in a linear chronologic order oftentimes doesn't isn't the most engaging format sometimes it's nice to and then you've got parallel stories too that follow that flow so if you've told all the stories sequentially then you're really just making three different stories that aren't really intricately related Mm -hmm. but if you can sort of meander between them you can hold the viewer's attention and tell three parallel stories that all sort of coalesce into one finale, if that makes sense, that's related. Yeah. Do you ever find, like, when you're making a video, it's like, when you think about the idea of the video surface level, it seems very obvious and almost easy. And then when you start to get into the nitty-gritty of it, it becomes overwhelming because there's so much you can do. I can relate to it because I see you do it, but I never really have to do it myself. Yeah. Essentially, I feel like the easiest way for us to, like, wrap our head around that story was kind of like, Instead of saying this happened and that happened, it was kind of like, here's a little bit of history so you understand, A, why we were in Vancouver, um, but then also tying in that storyline of, like, why we were back in Vancouver and what that meant, because we filmed a bunch when we were there in February, and we mentioned that in a podcast before with Chris and Lizzie and Iz and Johnny, we were there with them, and we wanted to create, like, we wanted to include that footage because this, one of the parallel storylines was, like, coming back to the city with friends we would have never met through, unless we had started YouTube. Like, right, through the but internet. that wasn't immediately apparent, the relationship, until the end where we said right. we would never would have been back here with friends if, if it wasn't for YouTube. Right. So, yeah, so that was kind of like one part of the story. And then I wanted to give you guys a bit of history on like what Newfoundland meant to us and the reason why we were in Vancouver to set you up for like the big you know, dramatic... The big letdown. The letdown, <laughs> the job loss, but then like what came out of that, which... Ultimately, the beginning part of the video was our story, but what came from that was more of like an abstract narrative that I feel like people would relate to or could could relate to in any part of their life with any kind of like their, of their own path or story. They could kind of fit that into that narrative. 
Yeah, we wanted the story to be relatable. Yeah. So having that abstract narrative, like alongside of telling our story, but then also that other story of going back for the first time since leaving, there's kind of like a bunch of different stories. And plus you telling how the year was for you and me telling how the year was for me. There's a lot of things to wrap your head around. Yeah, there's a lot of puzzle pieces. Yeah. And to get the essence, too, of the pain that we felt, I mean, like that whole abstract sequence with the watercolors, like it kind of sounds funny, like to talk about that that was like the one thing that was helpful to my anxiety to like do those because I'm not a painter. I'm not a drawer. And if you look at any of the stupid fucking paintings I've done in my book, like they're so bad. They're cute. They're little gradients. But like it was just I think it was almost like an ASMR thing. It's a therapeutic. It was wasn't the act of creating a painting well it was but it wasn't it wasn't the act of it wasn't about the end art piece right exactly it was the it was the process process. of just moving a brush and you know having it make a uh, a paint streak or whatever a gradient that you're making yeah it was therapeutic that was a fun sequence to reimagine because i kind of like put myself back there to like suck the color out of the grading of that and I, i think that's another thing we could talk about too like grading really can help tell a story but sucking the color out of like what's normally a very colorful palette of our colors now is like this bluish desaturated but it's still very light and airy because that whole thing like I felt during the time when that was happening I felt very unfocused and everything was like a blur and I felt like I had this like buzz yeah disconnected I felt like I had this buzz in my head and that's why we we paired it with that kind of like sound that high-pitched like ambient background sound Mm, because I'm ringing in the ears yeah because that's what I felt like like I felt like I couldn't focus on anything. The only thing that would calm me was doing the paintings and like running, which I'm not a runner, clearly. (laughs) But um, anyway, so that was kind of a fun sequence to shoot because we shot that with the 35, the sweet 35 lens baby, which gave it this like out of focus because I didn't want it to be sharp. I don't think you've used that lens ever. I've never used that lens. Not video anyway. No, I bought a kit of three lens babies. It was a sweet 50, an edge 50, and a sweet 35. Um, and 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 for anybody who doesn't know what those are, they're basically like... They're sort of like poor man tilt shifts. Yeah. Not so much to to correct perspective, but just to get sort of this oblique focal plane mm-hmm. so that like it can be partially, parts of the image can be partially out of focus, I guess, to make like an artistic sort of decision. Right. But they're inherently like flawed lenses to make it sort of out of focus and it fit the mood perfect for the sequence. Yeah. So it was fun to like shoot that. And that actually, that was your idea, Chris, to... Well, I just went into the gear shelves and just looked for i was trying to find something that had the closest focusing distance yeah and that was like yeah so we went back to our canon lenses to see if there's anything that had a macro setting Mm -hmm. and nothing really did so then i was like well if we disconnect the lens and we can sort of fake an extension tube to change the minimum focus distance of the lens but even with that it was very hard to still get the level of macro that we wanted but i think what we ultimately did was uh, we did a combination of the lens baby which inherently was a little bit out of focus and soft plus that lens is all manual focus by the way right plus the lens whacking with the lens detached from the body allowing light leaks plus that also inadvertently allowed us to focus closer because um it's like functions like an extension tube yeah so that was kind of fun to play with because like that whole sequence i wanted it to feel dreamy and desaturated and blurry and get that essence yeah i want to talk about the day in the life sequence and talk to you about that but moving on from that going into that waterfall narrative we we actually didn't shoot that with the intention of having that when we were in Vancouver we didn't have this video planned we just decided like when we were landing like oh shit like we should make a video and it can't just be a vlog it needs to be something more than that when you shot that FPV clip you just wanted to shoot a cool FPV clip I think (laughs) yeah Yeah, it kind of it was it was definitely a retrofit there's a few comments asking like oh my god did you shoot this clip with this, this exact sequence in mind and while I'd love to say yes we have that level of planning and dedication the answer is a resounding no. It was just, I was just shooting FPV clips and we had this shot that we wanted to incorporate. And then it was after the fact that we sort of said, okay, how can we incorporate this into the video? Not just as B-roll, but also as a, the like clip. A metaphor. In its, yeah, but also as a clip in its full entirety. Because I think for people who aren't really familiar with FPV drone clips, it's a fairly, uh, any, seeing any FPV clip is impressive, but I think that the whole take from top to bottom, mm-hmm. uh, it was a one continuous take that was probably over a minute long and rarely are you ever going to show a clip that's over a minute long right. in an edit. Yeah. And I was like, how can we show this clip in its full entirety? And the only way was to kind of have like this sort of metaphoric over, uh, voiceover. Right. And that's kind of how we, we sort of fit it in. Well, when we were planning the film, you were like, Ooh, I really want to use this shot and talk about how like 
because even back in Vancouver, I remember you telling me how your whole life felt like it was you were climbing a mountain. Yeah, during residency, I I was I start I came up with this this concept in my head because I felt like every milestone was like I, I used to kind of kind of describe it as the mountain on a mountain on a mountain on a mountain mm-hmm. analogy, and life's just a series of mountains. Peaks on peaks on peaks. Yeah, peaks on peaks on peaks. And you think that you're gonna when you when you look at the next big milestone, whether it be like getting into medical school. You know, it feels like a mountain in front of you. It's like, okay, I got to get good grades in undergrad. Got to do a lot of volunteer work. Got to do well on the MCAT. Got to do this. Got to do that. Got to get reference letters. And as soon as you get into medical school, you're like, oh, I've made it. I, I'm at the top of the mountain. And then the first two <laughs> week or two of medical school, you're like, holy nope. shit. I'm there back is, down. You're, you're like, oh, my God, this other mountain. I thought I was on the peak, but then I look up and there's another peak in front of me. And I don't, I don't like consider it as you fall back down because you've definitely made progress. No, you reached the peak and now you're onto your, your bigger mountain. It's like there was a cloud layer at the peak. And as soon as you got to the peak and emerged from the cloud layer, you now see this other mountain oh. in front of you and you don't realize you're at the top. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so that's what I feel like. I've always thought that like ever since residency even because I, I was like, wow, this whole like seeing another peak is a recurring theme in the pathway I've chosen. And then it repeats itself for fellowship and then yeah. it repeats itself for getting a job. So yeah, so life... that kind of like came full around when you're writing this narrative, when you had that idea. Yeah, and so I think that for this narrative now, you know, for that narrative in the video, we had this l- drone shot where literally it was climbing to the top of a mountain and then diving down. Whereas this, you know, and I think that this part of the story of our story, it felt a bit different in a sense that it truly felt like we built up all this and it wasn't a matter of seeing new goals. It was a matter of seeing all of our hard work fall apart. So I felt that that was applicable thematically from that standpoint yeah who knew you were such a good writer god i cry i remember reading it and crying and i was like chris can write i can't write dude you did a really good job like (laughs) mine was like i was sad and you were like benevolence and i was like never heard that word before sick i I had a vocab workshop when i was in when i was in grade six yeah part of our language arts i remember there was this Mar- these like modules we had to do every week which is vocab workshop and there's like 20 words in the dictionary that weren't all c- that common but it was i guess the goal was to increase your uh vocabulary mm-hmm. uh inc- expand the horizon of your lexicon well, clearly it worked and that i'm pretty sure benevolence was one of the words in that <laughs> i'm pretty sure a lot of the words i use yeah. was from vocab workshop oh my god that's so funny yeah. well it worked out it was a beautiful narrative oh thank I was you crying but thank yeah you. so that was kind of a cool way to use the drone clip It'd be sin to cut it up you know yeah, because that's that's the other thing too. When you use FV drone clips, oftentimes in edits they're very they're chopped up, and you only use one short segment. Mm-hmm. But there is, I do have an appreciation for an uncut, continuous FV drone cl- clip, just because it's not just like oh you lucked into one little area. Yeah, it's like okay you did, you got the dive into the waterfall, you dodged a few trees. You flew out of the open, then it's like, oh, then you nailed the gap through the trees before you went through the tree tunnel without crashing, mm-hmm. and then you could flip it back around smoothly and then go over the treetops. Like there's yeah. a, there's, there's, there's like a technical yeah, side to that. Yeah, I appreciate continuous takes. Yeah, um, you guys seem to really like that part. I think that was like a crowd favorite of the film. People like a lot of you guys commented how much you liked the FPV clip with that narrative. Um, I thought it was really cheesy actually when I was recording it, but I, was, you know. I thought it was good. That was the only way I could get a full FPV clip in there. So I had to leave the it. room while you're recording. I know. Yeah, I was too self-conscious. I actually got really self-conscious recording my stuff around you too because it, we don't usually script stuff. I actually get really usually self-conscious around you anyway. Like if you're watching me film, like when we, we did the NVIDIA video, which, which was just a tutorial. Yeah, it was just released. So that's on our channel too. I was super self-conscious you watching me. You don't have to be embarrassed around me. No, I know. And there's no reason for I've me. I've seen you naked. I know. <laughs> I'm basically half naked right now. <laughs> That's true. You're <laughs> yeah. wearing no shirt. I, outside. I know how to edit and I know how to do stuff. And I know what things are called. But when you're watching me, like the technical man, <laughs> I'm so afraid that I'm going to say something completely wrong and that you're just going to be like. That your live-in Asian tech support is going to shame you? Yes. Because I've always learned by shame from you. Tell you that you bring much dishonor to our family? <laughs> Yeah, like, thanks for, for all the love, too. Like, the the comments were overwhelmingly positive, which was really nice to read considering how much work went into that film. Like, when we landed in Vancouver, we decided to make this video. So it was about four months in the making by the time we had the idea, did the storyboarding, the scripts, figured out what that was going to look like. Um, that day in the life sequence, it's so funny, like, when we had planned that and storyboarded it out, we had our own, like, custom stock library of Vancouver footage because we filmed everything 
in Vancouver. Like I had a hundred clips of the Sky Train coming at all different ways. <laughs> I was like, oh, I really need a picture of like a video clip of Chris like walking with his doctor bag, and I had it. Like <laughs> a, a picture of Chris looking at an like an MRI had it. It was a CT scan. See, whatever. Rush dishonor. <laughs> but so that was kind of cool to have like those actual like even unlocking the door coming into the apartment. Like I had a number of you those had all clips. the B roll. All the B roll. So, I mean, I guess, like, not knowing how to tell a story back then really paid off because we just filmed everything. <laughs> yeah. But I also think that I like the idea of trying to show two diff- that we lived two different stories in Vancouver. We did, yeah. And we were trying to decide if we were going to film the interview stuff together to have more of a together dynamic. But I think ultimately, it'll filming it separately, our own takes on it, allowed us to have different sets, which mm-hmm. kind of mirrored the fact that we live two different stories. Yeah. I think we kind of alluded to that in the behind the scenes video we did for this on the Music Bed channel. Yeah. This podcast isn't obviously sponsored by Music Bed, but if you want to check that video out, we'll leave it in the show notes. We did like a full bef- like behind the scenes of how we did like storyboarding and, and scripts and stuff. Yeah. More of a technical how to or behind the scenes rather than what like we're doing thought here. Thought process. Yeah. Um, do you, do you feel like the day in the life was like representative of what your days were actually like in Vancouver? Cause I, I, like when I look back on that year and I know what my, my story was, it was a lot of alone. Um, and you coming home, like leaving early, early in the morning before the sun was even up and then coming home and just crashing right away and being on call. It was just like constant. Do you feel like that the sequence ended up being a pretty good representation of like your brain during that? Yeah, it was pretty hectic. It was just nonstop and it was hard work Yeah, for a full year. And I've always said, you know, I can do anything for one year. Mm-hmm. So for that year, it was just one of those times when it's like, okay, suck it up, do the work, and then look for the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. And the whole, like, again, going back to, like, the one of the points of the video is what you see on social media doesn't always equal reality. And we talked about your job loss a lot, actually, on Dave Mays' podcast. He, we did a two-part podcast with him and talked about that entire story. But your life viewed through social media from people back home like that was ultimately one like one of the biggest reasons why you lost your job yeah but so we really wanted to show people like what that actually looked like versus what people actually saw yeah because the the whole extracurricular activities thing was sort of an umbrella term for everything mostly surrounding the helicopter Mm -hmm. um but hearing from uh confidants back home who were tipping me off with information about what was going on and what the whole thought process was behind the big mystery group that, you know, the, behind the big mystery that the group was discussing, there were talks of, oh, well, does he even do work? You know, he's always out adventuring on his social media. So that, you know, that I'm sure, where I was told anyway, was a big contributing factor, mm-hmm. you know, and it's unfortunate that people create these, they fabricate these stories based on the information that they're given, which largely is just all propaganda because that's what social media is it's like it's a highlight reel of people's best moments yeah it's not the truth it's not no and that's why i thought it was so important to include that in the film to show you guys like what his year looked like and what my year looked like because i feel like you see helicopters and traveling and like the like collection of photographs that i've taken over a few hours over the weekend spread out over a month yeah it's like we spent 24 to 48 hours co- creating content mm-hmm. and then that content was basically like on ice put on a schedule and slowly released over the week to look like it was a constant stream of adventures yeah. when really it was a fraction of the time that we spent there mm-hmm. i had so much fun editing that sequence that was the first sequence i edited for the whole film was it really yep and looking for the correct track that like really represented what I felt like that track was very almost like safari, like (laughs) high energy. Yeah. Um, it was fun to edit that and using the titles and then putting the narrative together. It was, it was fun to do because it was different than what we normally do. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about some throwbacks and some ideas of things that showed up in the film that maybe you guys didn't notice and some things that you guys did notice that we asked uh, you guys to point out in the comment section of our video, which you did. So we'll be right back. Today's episode sponsor is Moment. They sent us their variable ND filters to test out, and so far they've been really lovely. The price is comparable to any other high-end filters, and they come in this gorgeous matte black metal tin with like a little spot varnish on the top. It, they're gorgeous. The cool thing about Moment's VNDs is that they make an adapter so that you can use them with their mobile lenses as well. So if you want to check them out, you can go to shopmoment.com 
Or you can check out the link to this product in the podcast description. You spent a significant portion of that ad talking about the packaging, I noticed. I'm obsessed. True Becky Peckham fashion. <laughs> All right, back to the podcast. Hidden, hidden uh, Little throwbacks. throwbacks to Vancouver. All right, so some throwbacks in the film that only maybe the people who have been with our channel since the very beginning in Vancouver would recognize. Mm -hmm. Number one. Well, first of all is the cover. The cover was a little more um, conceptual, I guess, that maybe nobody would really look at with the second eye besides it looking, I guess, kind of cool. But in the cover, the idea behind that was kind of like a rip out of the storybook, like one page out of your storybook of your life. And which is why we did the paper rip. So we had the paper ripped mountains, the kind of torn edge on the bottom. There was actually a one of the watercolors that I had painted during that stressful time overlaid in the sky that looked like clouds, very subtle, but that was kind of in there. We used a city skyline and then kind of masked in the text below it. And then we kind of made it like dark and desaturated because that's kind of like our aesthetic, but... And also the feel of the film. And the feel of the film, yeah. And so... I kind of mocked that up and then Chris took that and created that whole title sequence um, doing that whole parallax effect. So when we had like the logo come up and then the page ripped, um, it was kind of like that rough storybook kind of feeling. Oh, we have filmed a tutorial for that, how we, we did. did that. Yeah, we should do it. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of people ask, is like, is that just stock footage or did you actually rip a piece of paper? Yeah, we ripped a piece oh, of paper. You'll have to find, oh, you just spoiled oh, it. Oh, you'll have to find out. Yeah, you'll have to watch the behind the scenes, the how-to on it. Yeah, we'll put up a tutorial on how we did that. So that was kind of the thought process behind like the cover. And then we used that for the thumbnail. We used it in the title sequence and we used it to advertise on um, Instagram and Twitter. So another thing that we kind of put a lot of thought into or what we wanted to use as sort of a throwback element was the soundtrack with music choices. Back then we were using a lot of sort of chill hop genre style music. Mm -hmm, my favorite. So Still I feel like my favorite. I feel like when we listen to that music, it always takes us right back to Vancouver, especially when you hear those actual tracks that we used. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of the style of music that we tried to choose for those scenes yeah. to really kind of bring us back to there. I don't know if, if it probably wouldn't have the same effect on people who are unfamiliar with our channel. But for us, it takes us right back. Yeah. The other thing that you would notice if you watched the first season of the Vancouver vlogs, the only season of Vancouver vlogs, we went back to Taco Fino twice in the film when we were there in February. So once at the beginning um, when we were there, like doing the vlog segment of the film. And then a second time with Johnny is Chris. Chris wasn't there. Johnny is and Lizzie. We took them to Taco Fino. Um, and there was also a little quick clip of a La Taqueria taco in the shot too because we we ate a lot of tacos and we always joke that our entire first year of vlogging was just taco montage after taco montage yep. so we had to make sure that we included Lots extra taco mo montages exactly yeah we also when we chose the b-roll we chose clips from some of the standout moments or some of the standout clips that we we really thought were memorable for us anyway from the vlogs mm -hmm. I think that one of the first ones that I, or one of the most memorable ones is for some reason that clip of you uh, standing in the snow, it's like gently snowing, but with like big fat snowflakes mm -hmm. in your yellow raincoat. Yeah. For me, that was like a, a very memorable clip for some reason. Yeah. Same here. This is one of my favorite clips, I think from that year. Also, it was a really nice moment being up there as well. And we had like very recently had gotten the A7S2 at that point and we're just starting to do like slow motion stuff. So I think like seeing like the newness of shooting this 120p. This looks like a movie. Yeah. The funny thing is, like, when you look at the actual film that, like, or the actual vlog that that footage was in, like, it's terribly graded. Yeah. Um, because we didn't know what we were doing, so we were, it was OPP. It was OPP. Other people's presets. OPL. OPL. Other people's LUTs. Because when we started grading, we were using OPL for like a little bit, and then we learned how to grade ourselves once we got used to what that idea was. Well, it was kind of like we we've always like it's like a stepping stone. We always adjusted our footage. And I would always, quote unquote, color grade my projects, you know, doing video mm -hmm. when I was doing that for um, a side job. But then I remember like when it became really trendy to make the cinematic footage, people started selling LUTs and I'd slap these LUTs on. And it was like it would get it would make my image look totally different than what I was producing. Mm -hmm. And so for a while we just used OPL. Yeah. And then for the longest time I had this like almost cognitive dissonance where it was like I can also make call myself a video maker but still use other people's presets we've talked about this before on a different podcast 
but it's it's this sort of philosophical thing where one at one hand you can say well a director is still a filmmaker but he's not going to grade his own footage a colorist is going to do that mm-hmm. you can look at Lutz as just another way to to outsource a part of your project because yeah. you can't do it all right but at the same time as a photographer if you push the shutter release and s- someone else you know like someone else lights your scene and all you did was push the shutter button and then someone else edits your photo are you a photographer and right. a lot of photographers will say no part of the editing process is the development yeah. and therefore you're less of a photographer so there's way, different ways to look at it bottom line is we personally decided that um using other people's presets is giving up too much creativity uh and allowing too much of someone else as part of your creative process in our opinion mm-hmm. so we decided you know what we don't believe in using other people's presets that's just us that's our decision yeah and that's why we kind of take the approach of we don't sell our presets. Yeah. But with that said, we have a lot of grading tutorials and we're very transparent on how we get our look. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think, too, like when you're starting out, you do what you can to make the process easier because there's so much to learn and, and it becomes overwhelming. So, you know, for us, I think it was like, OK, well, we're learning how to make YouTube videos and we're trying to make our audio good and our videos good. But like we'll slap OPL on for now because we're perfecting these other things. And once we get a handle on this, then we can add color grading. Because, you know, if it's taking you a week to edit a video, plus you need to learn how to color grade, you're never going to get your video up. Right. So for us, it was like we could easily just throw slap on OPL, other people's LUTs, and get the video up. Yeah. But looking back on them, like skin tones, atrocious. Color, atrocious. atrocious. So <laughs> going back and picking those some of those favorite clips and regrading them, knowing how to use curves properly and HSL, like secondary masking and things like that. But more so having our style. Because I think after yeah, a while... Too. You know, we were all over the place with looks, just depending on what LUT worked the best. Oh, yeah. We were like, okay, this scene is like this. We'll put, we'll make this LUT. We'll use this LUT because it has this different feeling. Whereas now, literally like, just going through a drop-down menu and clicking like, oh, let's try this well, one. Well, it looks nope. good. Let's try this one. Nope. And it's so stupid. <laughs> it is. And so now we just, like, grade all of our videos the same because I think it makes a cohesive brand. When we did Cold Island, we did a slightly different grade. And for the film, we did a slightly different grade depending on the scene because mm-hmm. we know how to do that. Like, the Day in the Life sequence is very green and dark. Yep. Um, whereas like the rest of the film was a little bit like that. It still matched, but it was a little bit different. Bit yeah. And same Brighter. with like the, the contrast of your day in the life was darker and greener. Whereas like our weekends were a little more punchy, which right. is why I left in some more of that saturation. And like what you said with the watercolor sequence, it was desaturated. It was very high key look. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, I think that overall really kind of accented the feel. Yeah. I think that you can tell a story through grading even too. Yeah. I remember we made a, a vlog actually during Vancouver. It was, um, uh, two separate storylines. It was it was present day and us flashing back to mo- like coming down to Buffalo and looking for a house. And the present day was great to really warm and going to Buffalo is very blue. And that's kind of how we told two storylines was kind of separating them with a grading Now the grading was shit, but I thought it was interesting to do the two. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's kind of cool. Um, so another thing that was a little bit of a throwback in the film was when we were leaving the airport and we got in the sky train, there's a shot of Oak Ridge station. Oh, yeah. On the Sky Train. So probably not a lot of people realize, but Oak Ridge uh, and 41st Street, that was our stop. That was our subway stop. Episode one, sorry, of season one, where we, where you and my mom went to look for apartments. Like mm-hmm. you had a map there, which showed kind of basically where all the spots were. All looking the neighborhoods. At so that was kind of like a little throwback to mm-hmm. there. So in our pinned comment on the video, we asked you guys if you recognized any throwbacks for anybody who's been here since the very beginning, which mm-hmm. not many people have, because I think we were like hundreds of subscribers then. Yeah. Uh, so the first one is Farts Photography says... My favorite handle. Little throwbacks such as Helicopter School, Sky Train, and of course, Taco Fino, I didn't yes. know existed until watching your vlogs. Oh, Taco Fino is so good. That crispy, crunchy carnita that they only have at the Yale Town location is so good. <laughs> They're all good. I love them all. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. I, I recognize, I mean, with a name like Farts Photography, yeah. I recognize that name from the very beginning. <laughs> yep. Oh, 100%. <laughs> All right. Tyler C. says, been a lurker since the Renault days, subscriber since yes. the trip to Terra- Terrace video. Keep up the great work, guys. That's amazing. The Terrace video was, that was a long time ago. Yes. That was, all. actually, that was the first episode of, second episode of season two or something. That's when we were finished. I finished my fellowship, so I was finished my training. And, but I was still, we were still living in Vancouver. Mm-hmm. It was, but it was after we lost, I lost my job, but before we figured out what we were doing. Yeah. We had and, like a three or four month buffer. Yeah. So what I was doing was I was like, well, this all worked itself out because I ended up working part time with the group that I was 
had trained with. Mm -hmm. They gave me a, they're like, oh, well, if you don't have any plans, like we can hire you on. I was like, oh, great. Can I do it part time? They're like, sure, whatever. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Which was great because mm -hmm. it was, they were, very, they were so flexible. Yeah. They were super accommodating of you. Which was a stark contrast to the job back in St. John's that I lost, which was literally over scheduling and, you know, they, they, they were very inflexible. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, they were like, okay, yeah, fine. Work part-time, whatever, which was great. Cause then I finished flight school Yeah. and I, I was working as a radiologist part-time, finished flight school in the other part-time. And then one of the locums I did was through the group was I went up to Terrace, BC, which is like Northern up in the North, which is like rural, remote, far away from everything. I was so excited that you got to go up there because we had never really gone that far up in BC. Right. And I was home in St. John's for a couple weeks and you were up to Terrace, I think, for a few weeks. So I actually flew to Vancouver and then flew into Terrace to meet you there right. for like two or three days. Which was kind of pointless for you because, well, I mean, it wasn't pointless for you because you got to see the area, but mm -hmm. we didn't spend any time together. No. I was like literally working the entire day <laughs> yeah. till 10 p.m. every night yeah. because there was so much work to do. I remember we made this video and we called it, went to Terrace BC and saw nothing. And... Um, the reason why we named it that was because Chris, we were going up with these expectations of going on adventures and hiking and people were like, there's all these things to see. Like, here's a list of stuff to see. And in the reality, Chris worked from like eight o'clock in the morning until 10 PM or 11 PM at night. So he didn't get to see anything because he no. was working, not because Terrace was shitty because it wasn't, it was beautiful. Oh, beautiful place. Yeah. But somebody commented and they were so offended by the title. And I don't I was think like, that they oh. watched the video. I don't think they did either. I think but they that just saw like, the video and then said, oh, they assumed that it was negative when it was really just meant to be like, yeah. well, we didn't see anything but the reason is, is because, because we ended up working the, the schedule whole time. is so hectic. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that was my first taste in like, oh, clickbait title. Sometimes you had to kind of think of like titling for, through like multiple different eyes and how they could be taken. Not that that was like a bad, I mean, clearly you didn't watch the video. So that's fine. exactly. It's all, yeah. That's on them. That's not on us. So, okay. So next comment was by Adam Green. Uh, he said he started watching our vlogs to learn about Canadian life and ended up moving to Vancouver from the UK. That's amazing. I love that. That's so bizarre. Like, imagine, like, how do you, like, it's so random. You find some just random couple on YouTube making videos who happen to be in Vancouver. And then, but just, you know, I don't think that our experience in Vancouver is necessarily representative mm -hmm. of of what life as a Canadian would be like. But then again, whose life would be really? Yeah. You know? But, you know, that's like kind of a similar situation when we were moving to Buffalo and we found Billy and Pat. And we're like, oh, this validates that we can like live, that this is like a, right. a spot to live. But you who's know? to say that Billy and Pat's life would be anything like what our life would be yeah, like? Yeah, I know. It's it's crazy. But that's so cool that... But it turns out we're friends with name? Billy and Pat. Yeah. Adam Green. Adam Green. That's so cool, Adam. Yeah, he says... Uh, I've now been here for a year and I'm working as a video editor. Cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. What yeah. a great spot to be a video editor, man. Yeah, no, fantastic place to live. Yeah. Expensive place to live, but fantastic yes, place to live. Yes, that's why we moved. All right, so um, Madison, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bastardize this, Mashiels. Well, better than what I would try to say. Becky, I suck. Becky, your yellow raincoat <laughs> <laughs> instantly brought me back to your earlier work. God, also yes. love that opening with the rip paper. Yeah, that yellow raincoat was like the coat that I wore the in yellow raincoat with the OPL yeah with the OPL it worked really cool for color grading but that was kind of like my trend when I left St. John's I was like transitioning into more of like a monochrome wardrobe and I could only take a very minimal amount of things to Vancouver because our apartment was like 300 square feet not including the patio so I had like very minimal stuff and then we lived next to this store called Oakenfort which turned out to be my favorite very like androgynous boxy cut kind of stuff and uh, so that I guess that raincoat kind of got phased out after we moved to Buffalo because I went full monochrome. Yeah, you Vancouver was the was R.I.P. color for your wardrobe. Well, it was also R.I.P. color for our house because we bought a green bed. We had a blue couch and we we're like, this is going to be like because we thought we were going to be selling stuff when we moved because we thought we were going back to a full, fully furnished house. Right. So we were like, oh, we'll get color because the color would be cool. And now we have. Yeah, it stuff. was like, oh, well, we'll div we'll kind of just use this as an excuse to get color because yeah. we're we know what we're going back to. Same with the film. We were like, we know what we're moving back to. This doesn't it's not so scary moving now. Exactly. Well, it's and funny because we the, the navy really fits into the monochrome. You can make that look. Yeah, fun. that works. Yeah. So next comment was from Ian Chang. He says, I'm pretty sure I saw a shot of Osmo in that Oak Ridge apartment. I still remember the DIY project Chris did in the van in the parking lot. <laughs> oh my God! Yes. Good old Vancouver days. <laughs> yeah, they were good times, man. <laughs> times were different. The yeah. Osmo. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. The Osmo was we thought was going to be like the game changer 
the you know total revolution in vlogging cameras well because when we started the youtube channel and we were going to start vlogging like before that we were using 5d mark ii's on a steady cam like not right. a gimbal a steady cam yeah <laughs> and so we were like oh my god this tiny little camera is stabilized in this little tiny handle this is going to be incredible right and it wasn't because of all the shortcomings which we've i guess documented in many yeah, prior we did a videos full review i think that yeah. was the first time we shot on the a7s2 bottom line it. yeah bottom line was is that it just it took forever to fire up you had to use your phone as a monitor uh it just didn't work well didn't focus the hard, audio cut out sometimes hard like, to color correct yeah, yeah it, was, it was difficult had no limiter built into the audio it was just i don't know it felt like a, a beta release mm -hmm. it just didn't have all the, uh, the kinks worked out of it yeah yeah, in project it was in theory it was good, but in practice it was just a failure. Yeah. But because but we also bought a, a Phantom Four. Yes. A P4 for a drone, and mm -hmm. I remember thinking it's like, oh well, buying a drone is like, oh well, this Osmo, this would be a great vlogging camera. I was like, I'll just go all DJI, and don't get me wrong, D DJI makes great products. Their drones are fantastic. They're the, yeah. they're the only drones I use besides like FPV. Well, even FPV, I, I adopted oh, yeah, we have their, a FPV their HD FPV system. That's but anyway, right, yeah. the Osmo product line had um, a lot of room for improvement. Mm -hmm. All right, next comment is from Rapwire. I've been following you since before Vancouver. I don't even remember how I discovered you, but I distinctly remember watching the video where you and Chris's mom were looking for apartments and waiting to see the one you picked and how you decorated it. You must have been following our blog, which would have been like such a crossover like coming because our blog was like 100% home decor and home renovation, which is what we thought that the YouTube was going to end up being. Right. But then it ended up being adventure travel. Is that is there still a video which was a DIY how to lay laminate flooring? Yes. Is that still on our channel? <laughs> yes. The very beginning. So bad. How to lay. Step one. Yeah. But it was like very it was very HGTV. Inspired. Yeah. And that's like not what we ever wanted to go for. But, you know, you learn by doing it and looking right. back and being like, oh, this is this feels awkward. Right. OK. Next comment. Uh, Louis Luzaka, when I'm all in caps, when I met you at the Gary V keynote and we met D rock, that yes. was the coolest day ever. So happy for your growth. Oh my God. Yes. So Gary V came to Vancouver to do a keynote and I was like, I'm going. Cause during Vancouver, I listened to a shitload of Gary V like that was Gary V was in my ears that entire time. Cause I feel like when you're starting, sometimes you need to have like be listening to things like that positivity and growth and uh, listening to other people's stories and advice and stuff. So I was listening to Gary V, And so I, I bought tickets or I think, or went to see him talk and uh, I went and everyone of course was like bombarding Gary V, And I was like, I'm going to go talk to D rock because D rock, a nobody was really talking to him just for d rock is, oh d rock reference. is gary v's like filmer mm -hmm. like he's the one who, who follows gary around he's become his own character like d rock works like a crazy person i'm pretty sure trying to pump pump out because i think at the time he was doing like daily v which was like his daily vlog and d rock was documenting and editing them daily um i was like i'm gonna go talk to d rock because i'm making videos he makes videos that would be a cool cool to have a conversation and so i met this guy lewis and like two other dudes who were doing video i think they were vlogging as well so you know of course when you see the camera on a gorilla pod or a bouncy little mic you know you go and talk to those people so anyway yeah it was, it was cool cool to actually there's a, a video of that day link what, in the show notes yeah link in the show notes yeah yeah so that's it's cool it was cool to like go back through that and what did that like film mean to you well, i think we kind of talked about it about how this is like sort of the closing of a chapter. Yeah. To me, like finishing and editing this story and, and making kind of like this tribute was, it was like finishing the, the last chapter of a book and then closing the cover of that book and putting it on the shelf. Like, I feel like I don't even need to talk about the story anymore because I feel like it's almost a closure. Yeah. Or like it was like a form of therapy almost to like put that yeah. together. Yeah. Because I think that that whole experience, you know, while we know we landed with our feet up, although it didn't feel like it at the time, you mm -hmm. know, it happens so slow and change happens so slow that you don't really appreciate how far you've come. But looking back on it now, it's been so long. It's like, wow, so much has changed since then. So much. And I feel like it's so true that like time heals, you know, because things have definitely gotten easier. Like we started our YouTube channel four years ago, four years ago, we moved to Vancouver and you know, three years ago was when you lost your job and you know, it's super raw. The first, when it happens for six months, year getting you're bitter used, about it bitter you're, when you're someone, angry when someone does something that you view as intentionally malicious to mm -hmm. try to hurt you yeah it's with, a terrible feeling or just do it for their own benefit without any regard for the outcome mm -hmm. you know it just really leaves a bad bitter taste in your mouth it does, and you yeah. resent you resent so not just the one person but like the whole system everybody who enabled it mm-hmm 
even we start i even remember thinking like in my head newfoundland that place everybody there yeah you know this is this is we've been wronged and it's the whole province that did it but i mean you look at that and that's irrational it's an irrational thought and yeah. I, I even at the time i could look look at it objectively and say you know that's not a rational thing to think but you're salty as fuck like but you are mad. you just want you're mad and you just you want, want other take... people to hurt you know what I mean? you want to hate on some shit because you're hurting yeah you have these negative feelings and you just you just every you look through everything just negatively everything's glass half empty mm-hmm. and it's just you feel this you, you know you start feeling this this deep sadness and then it turns into this deep anger yeah and it's very hard to overcome that it is yeah and sometimes you know i think i realized at one point in my life you know it was kind of like I can continue to like harbor these ill feelings and these this negativity and I can let that shape me into who I am mm-hmm. or I can try to just like get over it. Yeah. You know, look at, hey, you know what? We've made real progress here. There are good things that come out of this. Mm-hmm. And then you can just choose to let it go. Yep. And it's like, okay, whatever, you know? It's freeing when you, when you make that realization and you can let it go. And it does take time. I mean, Jesus, like if you look at the timeline of when it happened in March of 2017, and then even coming down to Buffalo looking for uh, apartments and stuff and your job interview in like September, we were still hurting. And that was, what, six months? Yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I still think the asshole did it. It's a, it's a piece of shit. Yes. And I would totally tell him that if I ever right. came across <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah. I mean, you're not like, I mean, we were devastated. I remember coming down to Buffalo and, and when we, you and I had a discussion, we were at the hotel and we were laying in bed and you had just had your interview and we were discussing whether we we're going to move here or not. And I remember bawling. You cried. I cried. Because this is not how you envision your life panning no, out. No, it was devastating for me. And then the idea of moving down here and like into the city, I had no idea. Like, you know, and I, I don't think I had a great first impression either. When I left, that's when I realized that I, I had to make connections down here in order to make this work or else I was not going to be happy, which is then when I found Lindsay and Billy and Pat on the Internet. And that made that changed everything, you know, finding mm-hmm. people who were doing the same thing, who loved Buffalo, who were willing and open to <laughs> including somebody else in their friend group. And now they're my best friends. Like, yeah. it's insane. So, um you know, time heals, like you said, and changing your perspective helps immensely. And instead of just dwelling, kind of, you know, seeing what opportunities are kind of there and, and running with them and trying to look at the, the bright side and looking at things like glass half full instead of glass half empty and getting there is is challenging. Yep. But, you know, it's helpful to have a partner who's supportive and, you know, you're kind of lifting each other up. And I think it's helpful. It is definitely. So on that note, I think we're ended well, off. Well, first of all, before we leave... I want to say, I realized something the other day. Uh, I realized that you could um, get voice memos through the Anchor app because somebody sent me one and complained about the hiss that was in the background of the podcast. Free content. Yeah. But (laughs) but I I would like to utilize that. So in a couple of episodes from now, whether it's the next one or the one after, Chris and I are going to do a relationship Q&A. So I'm not sure if it works, so we're going to test it out as a collective unit, you guys, Chris and I. Download the Anchor app and send us a voice memo with your question about our relationship. And if we pick your question, we'll include your soundbite in the podcast. So make sure you say who your name is and where you're from and um, ask your question. And we'll try to include it in the podcast if it works. Okay. All right. Anchor app. So on that note, do that. And we will see you in the next one. Yeah. Thanks for listening.